Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, news feeds, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled Toxic Cocktail, How Chemical Pollution is Poisoning Our Brains. Our moderator today is Janan Jensen, Executive Director of HEAL, the Health and Environment Alliance. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read questions out for our presenter to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Janan. Thanks, Maria. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here today to moderate this webinar with Professor Barbara Demenix, whose research has contributed significantly to advancing more health protective public policy here in Europe. She is a professor of physiology at the National Natural History Museum in France and an internationally recognized expert on thyroid function, as well as the author of more than 160 scientific publications. She's trained in the UK, France, Canada, and Germany. In her latest book from Oxford Press, which is featured on the Che Call page, and a great read, by the way, she explains how exposure to endocrine-disrupting chemicals is resulting in reduced IQ levels in children and higher rates of ASD. And she outlines how to reduce exposure to today's toxic cocktails. Today on the webinar, she will discuss the effects of chemicals that disrupt thyroid hormone, a crucial hormone needed for optimal brain development, both before and after birth. We are very lucky to have this distinguished, committed scientist with us today from Paris, and we want to warmly welcome you to begin your presentation. The floor is yours, Professor Dominic. Thank you very much, Janon. It's a great pleasure to, to, host, to, to, to speak on this seminar. And uh, yes, we'll go straight into it. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the book that I have just published with Oxford University Press that is called Toxic Cocktail, How Chemical Pollution is Poisoning Our Brains. And in this, I wrote this book uh, because 15 years ago, I was asked to sit on an expert panel at the level of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, that does a lot of guidelines for testing chemicals. I was so shocked and horrified by the, the archaic manner which chemicals were being tested that I went out and I founded a company to do screening of chemicals. But I, I want to insist that I founded this, so I have to declare my conflict of interest, but I received no financial compensation from them. So, this is the question. What is causing this increase in neurodevelopmental disease that we are witnessing? The best statistics come from the States, where we can see that we're at one, and six, one in 68 children are affected, or are classed as being on the ASD spectrum, the autism spectrum. And a lot of people have suggested that it can be due to in increased diagnosis or improved awareness, but I think it's fair to say that 50% of this increase is not due to diagnosis or awareness change, and that we really have to think about gene-environment interactions. Now, this, is, this increase is also mirrored by an increase in attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, where we've got up to about 14% of children in, the, in, in some communities that are affected by this disorder. 
and it's 14% of boys in the same way that autism affects more boys than girls. And it's a very intriguing question as to why this is the case. Now, we all know that correlation is not causality, i.e. that it's not because you see increases in other things that they're necessarily the cause of what you're observing, Let's for instance, say for instance in autism or attention deficit. But it is indeed disquieting to see that production by the chemical industry has also increased over this period. And if we go back to the 1970s, and we can see that this increase in chemical production has actually increased 300 fold between 1970 and what we predict, this is the United Nations that has produced these figures, what they predict will be the case, estimated case in 2020. So, okay, there's been an increase in chemical production and there's been an increase in lots of non-communicable diseases, but I'm particularly concerned about diseases that affect the developing brain. And indeed, Linda Burnham, a one, uh, director of the National Institute for Environmental Health and, and Safety, has, ex has said that exposure to multiple chemicals is inevitable because we live in a chemical soup. Now, I don't want to get too scientific in this talk, but one has to sort of take into account that many of these industrial chemicals contain bromine, fluorine or chlorine, and these are halogens and they can interfere with thyroid hormone signaling. Now, iodine is needed to make thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone and iodine are needed to make a healthy brain. But unfortunately, both iodine uptake by the thyroid gland and thyroid hormone are absolutely essential for brain development and yet they are very vulnerable to endocrine disruption. Now, if we introduce this term endocrine disruption, we have to define what is the endocrine system. Well, I think most of you will know that the endocrine system is a series of glands um, of which the thyroid is only one. There's a, there's a thymus gland, the pancreas, obviously the sex hormones that are produced by the testicles and the ovary. But the thyroid gland is a very interesting gland and it's, um, it produces and it's, it's here at the base of your larynx and it's a sort of a, a butterfly shaped gland and it produces two hormones that are commonly called T4 and T3. And this is because T4 contains four iodine molecules and T3, three iodine molecules. Now, these hormones are absolutely essential for brain development. And in fact, this is a sort of thing we used to be aware of in, in, in Europe back in the beginning of the 20th century, cretinism because it has been said quite rightly that without a, the right amount of thyroid hormone at the right time, not only does a tadpole become, fail to become a frog, but a human baby becomes a cretin. Now, some people might not even know what the term cretin means. In fact, unfortunately, cretinism has, uh, the people that suffer from cretinism have IQs of about 35. And a lot of people think that because we don't see cretinism today, we don't have to worry about the, what are the causes of cretinism or what were the causes of cretinism, i.e. iodine lack. Iodine was discovered in you know, 200 years ago and thyroid hormone was discovered 100 years ago. Cretinism has been virtually eradicated because of postnatal T4 treatment. Every time a child is born in, in in uh, developed countries, within uh, four days of their birth, they are tested to see if they've got enough thyroid hormone to ensure that their brains are going to develop correctly, otherwise they're given postnatal thyroid hormone therapy. Now, we thought we knew everything we needed to know when postnatal thyroid hormone therapy was brought into play, but we have witnessed a revolution in our understanding of thyroid hormone signaling recently. And one of the things we've learned is that we need the mother's thyroid hormone, maternal levels of thyroid hormone are needed to get the early brain of a fetus to start to develop correctly. 
And this is an idea that has reached you know, the popular press. You're all probably all aware of different variations on this theme about in the Hit Time magazine um, seven years ago, how the first nine months of your life shape the rest of your life. But what we've learned about thyroid hormone signaling is it's the first three months in particular that are the most vulnerable periods of development. And this has been well documented in, in a number of studies, but one of the most recent ones summarized the situation that mother's thyroid hormone levels can actually modify their children's IQ and even the structure of their brain. And this has been done with magnetic imaging studies, etc. You can see that if the mother's got not enough thyroid hormone and even too much, the children's brain is modified and the IQ can be affected. Now, you can see this more visually if we look at the fact that, well, it's, it's not so much you can see the, the question of thyroid hormone, but you can see that the problem is that many of these chemicals that I was referring to, these halogenated chemicals, are such as chlorinated pesticides or triclosan or, or phthalates or um, PCBs, perchlorate, um, many of these chemicals are not only going to interfere with thyroid hormone signaling, but they're going to be present. We are finding them in amniotic fluid, in human amniotic fluid. And to sort of, so you can get a picture of this, we've done a, a series of cartoons. What we know now is that this early stages of development, the baby's brain are developed, are, are, are dependent on the right amount of thyroid hormone. Now, at the same time, we've got many chemicals that can interfere with thyroid hormone that are present in amniotic fluid. And I've just shown two of them here. BPA, infamous BPA or the notorious BPA, but flame retardants such as the brominated BPA that, as you can see, have a disquieting structural similarity to thyroid hormone. We can ask, we can, in the questions, we can, you can ask me why chemists have produced molecules with such strong similarity to thyroid hormone. Now, it's not difficult to understand that many of these flame retardants or other chemicals with a similar structure can actually take the place of thyroid hormone and modulate their, the availability of thyroid hormone and therefore the development of the brain of the fetus. So there's a lot of data there showing that number one, we need thyroid hormone, maternal thyroid hormone to make a good baby's brain. And number two, that many chemicals interfere with this process. And here is a list of 15 common contaminants that are found in human amniotic fluid and their concentrations. For some of you that have got a, a background in science, you can see that some phthalates are at 10 to the minus six molar, which means a lot of phthalates. And what, of course, is the question now that we're asking is what, are the, what is the effect of all these mixtures, many of which of these compounds affect the development of the brain. So what's the effect of these compounds as a mixture? Because we know that Certainly these compounds, mercury and lead, for instance, can disrupt thyroid hormone signaling and they can cause IQ loss. So we really have to be worried about exposure to these mixtures and what they're doing to the developing brain. Now, this is something that I, I often throw in because it's been calculated that over the last hundred years, we may or we have lost possibly 14 IQ points. Now, it's, uh, again, I, I'm, I'd be delighted to talk in, in the questions about how did people calculate this? And it's not IQ tests. It's and because they're obviously very difficult to, to compare across years. And, in, and when this, uh, um, if you go back to Victorian times, you're going to go back 100 years. So <laughs> there were no IQ tests there. But what these people did was they compared reaction times, how long it takes you to react to a signal. And oddly enough, even though you know, many kids today are 
on their computers and their iPads on their phones, you think they're reacting fast, but it looks as if they're actually reacting more slowly. So, and you can go from reaction time to general IQ, uh, because let's face it, uh, you can understand that the time it takes you to read or assimilate some information is also a matter of reaction time. And, and I, I, we, can, we can discuss this in, in the questions. And uh, another quite difficult concept is that if you take a, a population such as uh, the population of, uh, uh, of Europe, you've got uh, an average IQ at the moment, let's say of 100 or uh, across a population where you've got 6 million gifted or 8 million, uh, 6 million intellectually disabled. If you just have a, a five point IQ loss across your population, and we've seen this for so many things, instead of having 6 million gifted, you would go down to 2 million gifted and up to 2.4 million children that would be intellectually disabled. And of course, a child that's intellectually disabled is going to be an adult that's going to be intellectually disabled too. And this sort of decrease has been, and more has been documented for iodine deficiency, maternal hypothyroidism, for a number of, uh, well, for PCBs, lead mercury, et cetera, et cetera. And as I've said, we've got very little data on additive effects. So this raises the question of what can we do? Oh, sorry. The, Socioeconomic costs are enormous. This is the work of um, uh, Leo Trasandi, who, um, who I've also published with. And he, in the United States, he's calculated that it's the neurological conditions, including ADHD, autism, and IQ loss, that are by far and above the, the greatest cost of IQ, uh, sorry, of uh, endocrine disruption. But if you look at what's causing the neurological conditions, you're going to see it's flame retardants, plastics, pesticides, and other mixes of chemicals. And um, so it's neurological conditions, flame retardants are some of the primary causes, and plastics and pesticides are the others. So we can actually do epidemiological studies and relate the levels in the mothers during pregnancy and see how it affects the neurological outcome. And we can relate the causes to the effects. Now, my conclusion so far is that what we can obviously see is that chemical testing and regulatory decision-making is just simply not keeping pace with scientific knowledge. The other thing we know, and it's, it's particularly true, and we're living this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in, in, in Europe at the moment when we're fighting to get legislation through, we know that legislation has been de delayed by lobbying from the chemical industry. And so the next question is, what can we do as individuals? Well, we can't replace the legislation, but we can do a few things. And these are sort of, again, it's from my book, Toxic Cocktail, 10 ideas about how you can protect yourself and your, if you're a pregnant mother, your unborn, your unborn child, and mothers or autistic patients can also uh, pay attention to some of these things, but it's also for the whole family. Everybody can benefit from this type of advice. And now the first thing is avoid plastic in the kitchen. Try not to consume food and drinks that have touched plastic pack packaging because the plastics leach from the food in uh, from the packaging into the food and this is particularly the case if you've got um, a fatty substance uh, like cheese that's um, wrapped with plastics uh, glass or ceramic containers to microwave and similarly if you're drinking coffee or hot beverages from a plastic lined cup you're you're going to have um, in, in, you're going to increase the, the number of plastifiers that would actually uh, leach from the mug into your, into, your into your coffee. Stainless steel pans, buy organic if you can. Many studies have shown that uh, when people switch from uh, conventional food to organic food, their, their pesticide levels in their urine goes down immediately. 
you limit your consumption of tuna, swordfish, and salmon. And because these have got a, a high content of them, because they're at the end of the food chain, um, they're going to accumulate um, endocrine disrupting and uh, other chemicals too. So it's better to use small sardines and mackerels because they contain high iodine and they also contain selenium and less toxin. We can talk about why selenium is important too in questions. And um, the last point was uh, increase your iodine uptake. If you're pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, take mineral and vitamin supplements that contain 150 micrograms of iodine per day. And use iodized salt as well. People have forgotten the importance of iodized salt. It's very important. People think that the sea contains a lot of iodine, so sea salt will contain iodine, but this is a fallacy. So again, particularly true if you're pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, reduce your use of cosmetics. Number seven, if you're thinking of uh, repainting your car, uh, repainting your house or buying a new car, don't do it during your pregnancy. Wait until afterwards, uh, until the, uh, preferably a long while afterwards, because they will contain a lot of flame retardants and things like that. And try to limit the use of insecticides or air fresheners at home. And clearly, and this is interesting, I mean, nobody would in their right mind would take any form of medication if they are pregnant. And of course, this is the big irony today that we are told, all pregnant women are told not to take any medication except on doctor's advice during pregnancy. And yet, unfortunately, they are all exposed to so many chemicals that we have a, a very contradictory situation. And the last but not least is to wash all new clothes before wearing them. And uh, this is particularly true for toddlers and small children. So um, I think that's it. And um, oh yes, I mentioned iodized salt and uh, sea salt. It's a take home, a very important take home message. Sea salt does not contain iodine. It's much better to use iodized salt and add it to the food after cooking. Okay, we can talk about that afterwards. So just to conclude, 15 chemical classes are found in all adults worldwide. The placenta is not a barrier. These chemicals are found in amniotic fluid. We have found in the lab and other people that about two thirds of these chemicals will disrupt thyroid hormone signaling. And maternal exposure to certain of these chemicals is well documented as increases risk of neurodevelopmental disease or IQ loss. And we have such little data on combined effects. And as I mentioned before, legislation in the EU is currently blocked by lobbying. So there's a lot to do. And uh, at the level of the individual, you can do a bit, but what we really need is legislation. I think that's it. Oh yeah, and that's the... Okay, my blog and uh, the Facebook page. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dominic. That was a very fascinating uh, presentation, uh, particularly uh, interesting to hear some of your advice for individuals and the take home message about iodine, iodized salt. I hadn't realized that. Ha -ha! Um, I, I know. I'm, I was. Thank you. Um, I have uh, already a question. I'm going to go kind of now open the time for our question and answer for the next five minutes or so. You can type your questions through the question and answer feature available on the menu bar at the top or bottom of the window, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. I have a first question, um, which is what can replace the OECT, uh, OECD test guidelines that you are concerned are not working? Oh, I, I um, well, I, I think, well, first of all, we've got to apply them better. I didn't, I said they're not necessarily working. Uh, I didn't say that they were not working. I said they were, they, the tests that were being proposed in 2001, when I first sat on that, those committees, were not appropriate. And uh, we needed to improve them. And I've, in the last few months, I've been in, in a number of workshops where many people are, are realizing that we do need to update these test guidelines and to improve them. So it's ongoing. 
it's not so much the OECD that's at fault, it's the, uh, the tests uh, that are being proposed uh, and it, it does take a long while for a test to get through the OECD um, procedures of validation. So it, it's, um, we need to accelerate things and we need to improve uh, the, the test methods that are submitted to the OECD for validation. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, I have another question. Do you have thoughts about how thyroid disruption from contaminants might be playing a role in adult neurological diseases? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, we don't know. It's, it's, a fair, it's, a, it's a plausible hypothesis. We think it's very probable. Um, Obviously, there's a, a big increase in neurodegenerative diseases. We know that certain pesticides are associated with certain neurodegenerative diseases, such as pesticides that, um, uh, and, and, and Parkinson's disease. But it's, a, a very much, uh, um, it's not sufficiently researched, and, and it really should be, more, it should be examined in, in much more detail. There is very little data at the moment. Okay, thank you. I have a, another question about uh, concerning you had mentioned air fresheners were uh, something that people should um, reduce limit. or limit. And mm -hmm. the question is, what do you know about citronella air freshener? And I think it's, it's the air freshener, the essential oil or citronella air freshener. I'm, I would be very cautious about using a lot of any air freshener. Um, it's true, um, we think that things are natural and therefore they, because they're natural, they are harmless. But you just have to think that strychnine is also a, nat a natural product and it's a, a deadly poison. Um, it's always a map, you know, one has to be very careful. And um, so if you, are, if you, I don't, why, why bother to use an air freshener? Um, open your windows. Uh, uh, try to air your, your flat or your, your apartment or your house naturally. Um, if you find that there is a, a bad smell, it probably means there's damp or something else, and you should really find the source of that more than uh, cover it up with air fresheners. Okay, I have, I have one last question, and I think we're going to have to uh, close it up very soon, but a question oh, around... Sorry, did I take too long? Yeah. Oh, no, not at all. It's, it goes by very quickly. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you do only have five or ten minutes, so... Do you think slower reaction time is a developmental effect, or could a study be done that compares levels of certain chemicals with reaction times in humans? It's most probably a developmental question. Because myelin, which what I didn't go into the technicalities of it, myelin is this fatty sheath around neurons that speeds up the, the speed of a neuronal transmission. And this is a very thyroid hormone dependent process and it occurs during early development um, in a, in, in a in a toddler and also just before birth and in on after birth in, in, in humans. And um, it's true that if you were, you could also, being as it's a process that's renewed, you could also have effects later in life, but it's primarily a developmental process. Okay. Well, uh, we have other questions on the blog, but I, I think we have to, um, uh, maybe we perhaps could uh, forward them and see if you have um, some other answers. Um, but in closing, I wanted just to thank you very much for your, your presentation, for this uh, lively chat, and also to highlight to our viewers, that our listeners, that there is a, uh, a film being shown tonight on RT, uh, German-French television, which looks at EDCs, and um, as I see, you are featured in this film. So I think this is another opportunity for people to uh, learn more about the, the research you're doing. And I want to thank you once again and hand over to Maria to close the webinar. Okay, thank you, Janan. We are approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording of today's webinar will be available on the CHE website soon. Tomorrow, you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. 
but CHE EDC's Strategies Partnership will not be offering webinars in July and August, but will resume in September. Please visit our website, healthandenvironment.org, to learn more about future webinars from this partnership. CHE's next webinar will take place Tuesday, July 11th, and is titled, County Level Cumulative Environmental Quality Associated with Cancer Incidents. You can RSVP through CHE's website, healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to learn more about becoming a CHE partner, please visit the Join Now page of our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Demonix, for taking the time to present today, and Janan for her excellent moderation. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a great day.